Hello and welcome. On behalf of Observer Research Foundation, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all for the launch of the inaugural edition of our foreign policy survey, which evaluates the views of India's urban youth on the government's foreign policy, their assessment of emerging foreign policy challenges, as well as India's ties with key global and regional actors. Most significantly, perhaps, this survey is the first of its kind to consider public opinion on multilateralism and globalization. We are indeed honored that Foreign Secretary Sri Harshwardhan Shringla has given us his valuable time to launch this survey and to deliver his keynote address. In a democracy like India, public support for foreign policy endeavors is key to their sustainability. And therefore, regular surveys of popular attitudes to external relations is important for policymakers to understand popular aspirations. And there has been a dearth of such surveys in the realm of Indian foreign policy. We at ORF are striving to fill that vacuum with this small endeavor. As India's rise takes its place in the Committee of Nations, and as India continues its ascent in the global interstate hierarchy, foreign policy has become an area of great interest for wider populace beyond just a small strategic community. In particular, given India's demography, what young Indians think will determine India's future choices in more ways than one. And so we at ORF undertook this exercise despite the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic and sampled more than 2,000 Indians in the age group of 14 to 35 from 14 cities. The survey was administered in eight regional languages in addition to English. Four areas have been covered. Major foreign policy challenges for India and governmental response. India and the neighborhood. India and key powers. And most significantly, as I said, multilateralism and globalization. And what we found were some things which were very interesting, some aspects very illuminating, and some very surprising. Urban Indian youth surveyed in this poll have a largely positive assessment of the conduct of a country's foreign policy. This is reflected in their support for some of the government's key foreign policy decisions, including on China, Pakistan, and the Quad. And when we asked about major foreign policy challenges for India, respondents, perhaps not surprisingly, identified global pandemics and terrorism as the areas of highest concern. Other areas included cybersecurity, border conflicts with China, climate change, and conflicts with Pakistan also garnered high level of concern. But what this assessment told us is that in the realm of goal setting in Indian foreign policy, the top three priorities were strengthening the Indian economy, combating terrorism, and improving relations with immediate neighbors, except Pakistan and China. The next order priorities were certainly improving ties with the US and resolving differences with China and Pakistan. Government's approach to China in the aftermath of 2020 border clashes garnered strong support. And interestingly, a lot of support for uh, the decision to block Chinese mobile apps, which uh, for a young population, population sample, seems at times counterintuitive. When you come to the questions of India's neighborhood, Again, uh, there was a lot of positivity. The respondents were broadly positive about the state of India's bilateral relationship with its neighbors. And the respondents want the government to invest more in the neighborhood, both diplomatically and in terms of its outreach to wider uh, neighborhood, except apart from Pakistan. When we come to major powers, US is rated as the country that the young India trusts most among the leading global powers. And the US is followed by Australia, very interesting. And then Russia, Japan, France, the UK, and the European Union. And these perceptions have also been reflected in the respondents' vision for the future, about which powers will be India's leading partners in the coming decade. decade. And these include the Quad countries, Russia, Europe, in that order. There is a perceptible level of concern about the rise of China and its impact on Indian foreign policy priorities, and therefore, Questions pertaining to US and China dominate the discourse among the respondents. On the issue of multilateralism, particularly at a time 
when the global multilateral order is perhaps facing uh, one of the strongest challenges in the post second world war phase india and indian youth uh, is suggesting that india should prioritize global cooperation through multilateral organizations the indian youth displayed a high level of awareness for platforms for organizations and forums such as the un and the wto but what was interesting was that two thirds of the urban youth have said that they have not heard of the non aligned movement given india's historical connect with this it's it's quite an interesting uh, outcome on globalization the urban youth remains deeply divided uh, about the impact of globalization on indian economy on indian society on culture uh, while the opportunity to study abroad is viewed positively the optimism regarding moving abroad to stay or work is markedly much lower and what is also interesting is that the overwhelming support for atmanirbhar bharat abhiyan that came through in this in this uh, uh, survey perhaps a reflection of a growing demand in the in the urban youth uh, for the government to focus on domestic industries local job creation and national growth overall india's urban youth is optimistic about india's global role and wants india to be a responsible global stakeholder an aspirational youth wants an aspirational foreign policy approach and a confident indian youth expects a more confident assertion of indian global interests we sincerely hope that the survey's findings will be a springboard for future research and will lead to greater debate and discussion on the sources and conduct of indian foreign policy and diplomacy with this very brief overview of some of the salient aspects of the indian foreign policy survey 2021 let me now invite indian foreign secretary shri harshvardhan shringla for his keynote address to launch this inaugural edition of the survey sir the floor is all yours professor harsh pant my colleague edition secretary shri ashok malik distinguished guests dear friends at the outset let me thank the observer research foundation and professor pant for inviting me to release the orf foreign policy survey 2021 entitled young india and the world i convey my best wishes to the speakers for the panel discussion on the survey i am pleased to note that the orf has for many years provided a platform for young voices in the strategic community the raisina young fellows program continues to attract some of the brightest minds from across the globe the orf foreign policy survey 2021 is another important step in the democratization of policy understanding and shaping i hope this survey will act as a useful academic tool to understand public discourse on india's foreign policy it is said that perceptions matter and the perception of over 60% of india's population the youth matters significantly more our nation is witnessing a historic demographic shift that has the potential to yield rich dividends india's ability to find its rightful place in the world will depend on how we harness the strength of our young population and it is indeed encouraging and heartening to find that more and more young thinkers are taking an interest in foreign policy at the ministry of external affairs we have undertaken a series of initiatives that will allow critical young minds to contribute to the nation's foreign policy making process we are constantly working towards expanding the various options available to young academics and scholars allow me to take this opportunity to highlight some of these initiatives our ministry accords high priority to engaging academics based in universities and think tanks and utilizing their expertise in the preparation of research papers and policy briefs on foreign policy issues the ministry supports universities think tanks and academic institutions for the conduct of national and international seminars and thematic conferences on a regular basis 
The Ministry of External Affairs started working with scholars in 2015 on certain specific areas of expertise. They have been a welcome addition to many divisions of the ministry. The ministry has benefited from their fresh approach, thematic expertise and contributions in research and strategic planning. We have also recently revamped our internship program. We have devised a procedure to ensure participation from every state and union territory in the country, while encouraging a healthy gender balance. Selected interns will have a unique opportunity to work on a desk of their choice in the Ministry of External Affairs, along with suitable mentorship and guidance. The program is intended to provide first-hand exposure to the functioning of the Ministry in diplomacy and foreign policy. Some of our recent initiatives have been aimed at demystifying foreign policy for Indian youth in different parts of the country. Through our SAMEEP initiative, we encourage young Foreign Service officers to reconnect with their educational institutions and share their experiences with students on contemporary and popular foreign policy themes. We have also reached out to the strategic community at all levels. I have spoken extensively on the contours of Indian foreign policy at various events organized by think tanks, universities, academic institutions, public forums, and industry associations. One of the largest beneficiary groups from our Vande Bharat mission that deals with the repatriation of Indians from abroad were Indian students and young professionals who would otherwise have been stranded on foreign soil during the COVID-19 outbreak. Now, as life gradually normalizes, the ministry is working with partner countries to facilitate visas, mutual recognition of vaccine certification, and necessary permissions for Indian students to head to educational institutions abroad. In line with the Honorable Prime Minister's vision of making India a hub for international education, the Indian Council for Cultural Relations, the ICCR, provides more than 3,000 scholarships to foreign students every year. ICCR has also established chairs in foreign universities in different Indian disciplines and is in the process of setting up chairs of neighboring countries in premier Indian institutions. For example, this year, ICCR and Delhi University set up the first academic chair on Bangladesh in India in honor of Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, father of modern Bangladesh, and to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Bangladesh Liberation War and India-Bangladesh relations. The MEA is working closely with our Ministry of Education to promote the new education policy with our foreign interlocutors. I'm happy to learn that the ORF foreign policy survey results indicate that urban youth are appreciative of the strides made through India's neighborhood first and act east policies. While national interests and security are the main drivers of any foreign policy, a lot more transpires. International relations and diplomacy also affect our daily lives in terms of our environment, society, economic development, and education. Appropriately, the ORF Foreign Policy Survey has been conducted, keeping in mind the increasing osmosis between domestic factors and foreign policy. The scope of the survey, done in 14 different cities and eight regional languages, is commendable. I understand that it is the first survey to consider public opinion on multilateralism and globalization, including in the context of the COVID-19 crisis. It is heartening to learn that more than seven, of the ten seven out of ten respondents have rated major Indian foreign policy decisions in recent years as very good or good. Well over 50% of youths taking part in this survey rightly believe that over the next decade, we will strengthen our partnership with major global powers, including most of those in the permanent file. Going ahead, this survey will provide useful inputs for foreign policy planning to meet the aspirations and goals of a young India, a vibrant India, and if I may add, an Atmanirbhar Bharat. I would like to conclude once again by congratulating the ORF and its Strategic Studies Program for conceptualizing and conducting this foreign policy survey. I look forward to many more initiatives in the future. Thank you. Dhanivad.
Namaste. Thanks, sir, for your very encouraging remarks about the need for such surveys and about their role in shaping policy decision making. Your point about greater involvement of the nation's youth in shaping foreign policy discourse and practice is well taken. And the recent attempts by the MEA to involve youth in, their, in its functioning will give great encouragement uh, to this nation's youth as they take a greater interest in how India engages itself on the external front and as India's rise in the global hierarchy continues. It has been a privilege to have you with us today for this launch. Our heartfelt thanks once again. We aim to institutionalize the foreign policy survey as an annual endeavor to track how Indians comprehend the country's foreign policy goals and its approach to external engagements. So this is not a one-off product. This is something that we will be continuing over the next few years. And hopefully this will generate enough data points. This will generate enough uh, discussion and debate uh, to enrich India's foreign policy practice as well as the study of Indian foreign policy. Let me thank my excellent team of researchers without whom this survey would not have been possible. Prithvi Ayer, Arshi Terke, Nivedita Kapoor and Karthi Bomakanti, uh, they all managed it seamlessly from the start to the finish. Thanks also to the publications team, uh, especially uh, Vinaya Mukherjee and Rahil Sheikh for coming out with an excellent product uh, that we see today. And special thanks also to Impetus Research for being a great partner in this journey and we hope to continue on this path uh, for the foreseeable future. For the full survey and report, please do visit our website. And with that, let me hand over the proceedings to Maria Shakil, who will be conducting a session with some of the finest minds from around the world to dig deeper into the findings of this survey. Maria, over to you. Thank you, Harsh. And let me introduce my panelists this hour. Naeem Razak is a member of parliament in Bangladesh. Tara Varma is policy fellow and head European Council on Foreign Relations, Paris, and she works there. Natasha Kassam is a director, public opinion and foreign policy program, Louis Institute Australia. We have Abhinav Prakash. Uh, he's assistant professor, Sri Ram College of Commerce here in India and Nivedita Kapoor, junior fellow, strategic studies program at ORF. Uh, Nivedita, I'm going to begin with you because this is certainly an interesting ex exercise to put the spotlight on the youth of a nation. Uh, I'm not too sure in recent history, such an exercise has been undertaken by any of the think tanks. What made you do so first? And does the, do the findings, uh, are they really in sync with uh, what is the popular understanding as far as Indian youth and their inclination on issues of foreign policy are concerned? Thank you, Maria. Uh, I think uh, it's a very important question in terms of why did we pick this demographic? And our main idea was the fact that about over 60% of India's population is below the age of 35 years. And while we do understand that policy making is essentially an elite exercise where uh, you know the high levels of intellectuals or the foreign policy community is involved, but in a democratic setup, it's incredibly important to understand how people perceive the foreign policy decisions that are being taken. Hmm. And this is especially important because it's, it's critical to mark the shifts in public opinion, because we are seeing Indian foreign policy evolve very rapidly to the changing situation. So we also need to understand what are the kind of shifts that are happening in public opinion. And it's the youth who have the most stake in the Indian foreign policy in a sense, because A, they are the ones who will be shaping this in the future. And at the same time, it's their lives which will be shaped as a result of the decisions that are being taken today. So yeah. for all of these reasons, we believe that surveying youth is a particularly important exercise, which is why this poll uh, was conducted in 2020 and now ORF plans to institutionalize it, do it on an annual basis. And I think that will provide Indian foreign policy making with a very good set of tools to help us understand through specific data available to us, 
as to how are the people perceiving the foreign policy decisions of the Indian government? And you know, you made an important point about youth being a stakeholder. But my question before I bring in other panelists is also this, Nevedita, that this specific point or the time period in which these questions were asked was around the second wave. What made ORF undertake an exercise of this nature during the time of pandemic? Because this is once in a lifetime uh, you know, event that we are seeing. And in this period, just about everybody is thinking differently. The challenges are different. Why do a survey of this nature at this time? Uh, Maria, as you yourself said, that several shifts are taking place at this point in time. And once the pandemic hit, uh, I think the practitioners of international relations realized that the trends that we had been seeing, whether in terms of great power competition, whether in terms of rise of China, the way the emerging powers and the middle powers are reacting to this churn in the international order, all of these trends were being accelerated and, and it was incredibly important for us as students of international relations to see where these trends would take us. And when we realize the magnitude of these changes and, and we see the Indian foreign policy also react dynamically and in real time to these changes, you know, whether it's the movement towards the Indo-Pacific, the way the policy towards China is being redefined, the way India has become active on several fronts in Eurasia, so these are very important shifts that are happening in Indian foreign policy. And given the pace of those changes, we also need to understand if the people have been, uh, whether they are uh, agreeing with these policies, do they differ? Uh, do, does their opinion diverge on these policies? So uh, we understand that you know this was a very difficult time. We did the survey in December 2020, which was just before the second wave. Uh, but I think the data that we have today, it will be very interesting to see the next year when we conduct the survey, I think it will give us a comparison of whether anything has changed after the second wave. So, you know, the way we can see the Indian public opinion evolving would be a very interesting exercise. Okay, Natasha, you know, you have done similar surveys in Australia. Um, so I want to explore the similarities and also the differences that you are seeing vis-a-vis uh, -vis the youth. Natasha, you have to unmute yourself. Thank you so much. And I just wanted to congratulate ORF and Nivedita and her colleagues on, on this very interesting survey. You know, from my perspective, looking at young Australians and their view of the world and young Indians and their view of the world, there's, for me, one very clear parallel and then one quite clear difference. So the, the parallel that I see is that increasing negativity towards China. You know, both India and Australia have become closer over the last couple of years. And in part, that is because of shared concern about China. And that is clearly reflected in the public opinion in both countries. Now, where I see an interesting perhaps divergence is the way in which young Indians appear to trust the United States. I thought this was a really fascinating finding that the United States was essentially at the top of the list of trusted countries for young Indians. That is certainly not the case when it comes to young Australians. Young Australians are quite skeptical of the United States, not, not as much as China, but when compared to their older counterparts, I think there's a lot of anxiety about US influence in Australia, about Australia's participation in military conflicts because of the United States, and of course, the legacy of former President Trump. So those are the two things that really stood out to me when comparing the way Australian young people and Indian young people look at the world around them. Hmm. Okay, uh, part of the specific point about Indian youth and their tilt towards West. Uh, there is the specific point uh, in the survey, one of the highlights clearly talk about how, uh, you know, more than seven of every 10, that is 77% of the respondents rated the US as the country they trust the most among the leading global powers. The US was followed by Australia, Russia, uh, Japan, France, and UK, and the European Union. 
why is this perception continuing despite the Trump era? Well, thanks a lot, Maria. Thanks a lot to ORF uh, for inviting me as well. Um, I think what we see here that for India, the US remains the main superpower. And there is certainly an issue for India maybe to get closer to this vis-a-vis -vis the tensions uh, with the Chinese neighbor uh, and increasing tensions right now. I think, I mean, as for Natasha, the, the figure of 70% of respondents that put the US first um, is quite striking, particularly when you think about the, the Cold War era and the fact that India was more aligned in a way uh, with Russia. But I think when you look at the preferred partners in the survey, and I really think the figures are fascinating there, right? the preferred partners um, for India in the future are Quad, Russia and Europe. So that really means a diversification um, of partners. And you can see here, it is probably um, a reflection of what uh, uh, Minister Jay Shankar calls, you know, the new Indian foreign policy, which would, which would, um, which would would translate itself into alignment. So it's not non-alignment anymore, but we are looking, Indians are looking to ally with several partners, not dependent on only one, but looking uh, looking for partners basically in every region of the world, except for China. Hmm. Abhinav, on that specific point about India youth's engagement with globalization and multi uh, lateralism. There is a point here about RCEP, uh, the area where the government has the respondents' least support concerns the country's withdrawal from regional comprehensive economic partnership. Um, this is coming at a time when uh, most of the foreign policy decisions that have been taken by Prime Minister Modi and the government has won overwhelming support by the Indian youth. In fact, 72% of respondents have rated uh, his overall uh, foreign policy as either very good or good. Yeah, uh, and that's very interesting because uh, you see there is a broad-based support for the uh, foreign policy of the government. But when it comes to certain issues, you can see that this is, picture is still not very clear because lots of people support Atnirbhar Bharat campaign of the government, which is self-reliance. Then you have the uh, the least support for the withdrawal from the trade agreements as well. So I think the, the picture there is not very clear from the survey. I think we have to dwell deeper into this aspect. What I think is happening that people or the youth do not see a contradiction between globalization and a self-reliant India. Uh, unlike in the West where there's a backlash against the globalization, in India, the backlash against the globalization is not on the economic front. So people see, uh, entry of foreign companies, foreign investment, FDI, as increasing their job opportunities, economic prosperity. They think that by being part of the global trade blocks, they will gain. But that is that is uh, that that has a that has a uh, issue as well, because uh, we are we are not taken or we have not specified that how much the labor class of the country has been interviewed in this survey. Uh, what is the opinion of the labor class who have been losing job uh, because of, uh, you know, or just the small traders as well, who businesses are being affected by the, uh, let's say, free trade, which India has adopted in the last few decades. On the globalization, Maria, there's one another specific point that uh, the, the, the youth is not very really clear about the impact of the culture, uh, impact on the culture, because I think they, that is where we will have this divergence because Indians want good relations with the foreign powers. Indians want good relations with America. They are open to working with the global organizations. But when it comes to the global values, right, we have seen this thing backlash coming from India again and again, that the West should not be speaking in the case of uh, Indian matters uh, on the issue of human rights, on the issue of, uh, let's say, cultural, religious aspects. So I think globalization picture needs to be explored a bit more when it comes to this uh, survey. Okay, Nivedita, will you respond to that? That cultural aspect in this survey is also very critical. The Indian youth is increasingly becoming a participant in that dialogue around culture because uh, and also human rights issues. Uh, they are no longer, they tend to see West also as those who should not be perhaps interfering in the issues which are seen as intrinsically Indian. 
Uh, well, I, I totally agree with Mr. Prakash in this case that, you know, uh, the way Indian youth respond to the questions of either human rights or, or the cultural uh, questions that, that sort of come out of this issue of globalization, they react to any sort of criticism of India's uh, performance on these indicators very negatively. And I'm saying this based on, you know, the kind of social media responses we see on uh, whether it's the U.S. report on India's freedoms, etc., uh, but I think in terms of uh, when we do take our place uh, at the world stage, we want to have a say uh, at the decision making table. Then as we continue to, to expand our engagement with the world, we also have to accept that some of these criticism, criticisms will come to us because we do say that we are a democratic nation. And, and a very essential part of that democracy is being able to have a conversation both yeah. with our critics and with our supporters. So, so I do understand that th there is going to be sort of some sort of a conflict involved, but uh, but I don't think that's essentially negative in a democracy. We have to go through this process and sort of become a stronger democracy. A and it's good that you know if we can map these changes, say through our our policy surveys, it could be probably be a good question for our next survey. If we can keep mapping these developments, maybe we will see over the time a maturing of the position. Uh, and I think those kind of uh, details would be very interesting to watch out for. Yes, and I would also want to know as to where are they consuming information from, uh, which is actually leading to shaping of their views around foreign policy, because that is something that will again uh, decide the direction of their thought and the approvals that they have given on a number of these questions. Uh, the opening comments also now to Mr. Razak. Mr. Razak, uh, the Indian youth certainly uh, believes in engaging with neighbors, but not as much as Pakistan. That goes with the government's idea of their foreign policy. And of course, the, Ch the China factor is also at play here. Look at one more highlight here. Questions pertaining to India's neighborhood. The respondents were most trusting in impact of Sri Lanka, 68%. That could be because of uh, the beautiful uh, country that it is. And uh, they displayed low levels of trust towards Pakistan with only 10% of respondents indicating positive trust ratings. They also uh, hold positive views of Maldives, Nepal, Bhutan. Eight of every 10, that is 80% of the respondents felt India has poor or very poor relations coming to Bangladesh. Respondents also believe relations with Maldives, Bhutan, Bangladesh and Afghanistan have improved in six recent years and hold greater potential right maria thank you so much i think it's a very interesting topic to discuss about i think the the most important part is that the historical relationship that bangladesh and india holds and of course when we talk about from the youth's point of view we need to understand whether they are very much literate in terms of how these diplomatic ties and how these relations are built so this is something this uh survey itself i think can be a groundbreaking report itself so to understand how to create that ecosystem where the two nations or the neighborhood relationships can be built in, in a much more uh, stronger bond so when we talk about the youth of course you know we derive a couple of when we, when we derive the policies these policies of course needs to be uh, defined in a much more kind of simpler simplicity or a simpler way so that the youth can connect. When we talk about the youth, the youth can relate to their own needs and their uh, relations with different aspects and issues, such as, let's say, trade and commerce or education. You know, if you talk about the tourism sector itself, uh, I think uh, Bangladeshis are one, every five tourists are from Bangladesh. So this is a huge number that we're talking about. But culturally, we have a lot of integration and a lot of mutual respect. Unfortunately, the distrust comes from uh, various issues, such as the New Citizenship Act, or when we talk about, let's say, uh, for instance, in September 2020, uh, India, uh, of course, put an embargo on onion imports. I'm just saying on a very layman uh, view itself. So India is the largest exporter, but then again, the embargo created 50 percent hike on prices so these things matters and these things creates um, some sort of negativity towards uh, indians foreign policies 
So on those grounds, I think more of a community-based activism is much more required. And from Bangladesh's part of view, the youth of Bangladesh, I think you, the youth of Bangladesh, they understand the necessity for building a greater relationship, a better relationship with India solely on the basis that we have had a historical value uh, since 1971, uh, the war of independence, and of course, over the course of years. And in the last 12 years, we have seen tremendous collaboration between Bangladesh and India in terms of economic development, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of cultural bonding, and so forth and so forth. So this is something that we are, from our part, as I work closely with uh, a lot of youth organizations, we like to and we would love to engage with the youth of India so that we can build uh, a mutual relationship where we understand each other's value in this relationship. I think this is very important and that's where there is a little bit of lacking which exists. From a government to government point of view, of course, there are tremendously uh, we have built tremendously good relationship over the last 12 years and we have seen uh, huge, huge uh, projects which have been um, collaborated together. If you see in the region of uh, the LOC, which has been uh, the line of credit, which has been uh, given by India, India has committed almost about 7.8 billion US dollar. So this is the people of Bangladesh and the youth do understand that India is trying to build a good relationship and trying to build, as uh, Prime Minister Modi has said, you know, a good neighborhood relationship where everyone can grow together. So that's uh, what I think should be the thing. And of course, when we derive these sort of uh, foreign policies, uh, it has to have a defined and a very simplicity, simplicity manner in terms so that the youth can actually engage more in these in these foreign policy dialogues. Yes, thank you, Mr. Raza, for those opening comments. And then I'm just broad basing the discussion now. Um, and I'll begin now with Tara. Tara, you know, while we look at the level of engagement, uh, we have seen in recent times there is an increased concern, particularly, and that is reflecting also in this survey among the youth uh, towards China. And that's also because of what has been happening along the line of actual control. As the situation improves and the process of disengagement begins, uh, are you getting the sense that perhaps that distrust that is so intrinsic among the youth that will improve? Because let's not forget that it is, China is our neighbor and we have to, we don't have the option of choosing our neighbors. But at the same time, Indian youth realize that when it comes to job opportunities and other opportunities, they have to have uh, businesses and other trade interests with China. You are absolutely right, and I'm quite struck by the fact that this youth seems to be very open to the world. Um, and, and when we talk about the youth of India, we, we think about the sheer amount that it represents. It's, according to the last census, it would be 65% of the total population, so that would mean between 800 to 900 people. That is <laughs> quite a lot. Uh, and they are concerned with the world. They know that India cannot manage on its own, and actually, it, you know, it should not manage on its own. It is a big country. Uh, it has an outlook to the east, to the west. So it needs it needs to look for to look out for itself and to look out for its neighborhood. Tensions with China, unfortunately, are not decreasing. We we're seeing now that there are U.S. U.S. China tensions. There are U.S. Uh, there are EU tensions. Um, the EU declared China in 2019 to systemic rival, so that would mean that actually the European Union considers China to have a system of governance that is increasingly different from the EU and that is not going to change. We are seeing increasingly uh, dictatorial um, stances coming from uh, the Chinese Communist government. So this is a reality. And there is a true question about whether India was a pioneer when it banned uh, Chinese apps a few months ago, we saw the impact that it had. You are right. It's not possible to cut ourselves from China. I think this is what the US and the EU um, are realizing. But there is certainly a case uh, for India, the EU, the US and others to leverage their relations with China. That comes with the economic issue, but not only. And this is going to be an unavoidable issue for India because in addition to uh, economic tensions, there are also technological and military tensions 
um, on its border. And so I think it's, you know, the diplomatic route should always be followed as much as possible. There are personal contacts uh, between uh, Prime Minister Modi and President Xi Jinping, and this should go on at a very high level. But we're mm. also seeing that there are um, increasing provocations in the way uh, coming from China, and that is not going to, when you read the op-eds from the Global Times uh, or other uh, Chinese newspapers, it's quite clear that, uh, you know, there are caricatures making fun of the way the pandemic hits India. There are caricatures of how the Indian government uh, is dealing with that. And, you know, that would be fine, I guess, in a democracy where uh, you have an, an open and free debate. But this is kind of the only type of information that the Chinese people are getting as well um, about what is going on around the world. And so I'm not too optimistic about the Chinese population and the Chinese government having an open hand with India. That doesn't mean that India should have a closed hand, but it means that it needs to be very realistic about what the possibilities are of trading with China um, in a neutral manner. I'm not sure that that's possible. You can't really separate, especially when it comes to China, but I think that's true globally. You can't separate economic interests from geopolitical interests. And I think uh, the US and the EU are understanding that in their relation to China very clearly. And I guess India should, should also look at that. And I'm, you know, that, that is absolutely true for, for Australia as well, which is, uh, which, you know, which has to bear the consequences of economic coercion coming from China, and it has had to bear those consequences. Yes, for you know, Tara, that's, to that point, it's a, uh, the quest for education or opportunities take Indians to various countries. But at the same time, uh, in this survey, there is that emphasis on Atmanirbharta, or what we have been saying, and that has been the push by the government of self-reliance. Uh, you know, it said that 71% of respondents felt that Atma Nirbhar Bharat Abhyan of the government of India of economic self-reliance is the need of the hour. Is this also coming in with, because of the realization that the pandemic hit us as it did to the rest of the world, but our economic challenges were far greater than others? You know, I think there is always, there has always been an, a true tension that is specific to India about focusing on domestic issues, economic and political, and ha having an outlook towards the world. The fact that foreign policy remains an elite discussion doesn't help with that tension because, you know, it's not part of the global discussion, except basically when the US and China. So the focus on domestic self-reliance, the focus on domestic growth, that shouldn't go, of course, it is a priority. But what we've also realized, particularly in the pandemic, is that India is the world's pharmacy. Most of the, the big pharma rely on, on their manufacturers uh, in India to produce the vaccine that is needed everywhere in the world. There is, that is just you know, one specific example of, of how you can reconcile this tension. You produce in India, so you hire Indian workers and you uh, have Indian economy to develop vaccines and to distribute them around the world, which is a way for multilateralism to work very concretely and for the global health agenda to move forward. But I don't, I don't think we should negate uh, domestic growth should remain an Indian priority, but that doesn't mean for India to cut itself from the rest of the world. And as we see from the report from ORF and generally speaking from the news, that is not possible. It, even if India wanted to from the world, actually there are tension and news coming from the rest. And, and it's not possible for India. I think there was a period in which India really thought that it should focus on its domestic growth and be self-reliant. And that would mean to cut itself from the world. Honestly, I don't think that's possible anymore. And I don't think that should be something to look forward to either. The yes, you know, Sarah, in these times, we have seen India support the rest of the world, particularly on the issue of vaccines. Um, Abhinav, would you take the discussion forward particularly because Indian youth, they believe in mobility, they believe in going abroad perhaps for travel purposes or also uh, for education, but at the same time they certainly would want an India which is far more self-reliant. Uh, yes, Maria, you see the, 
the top priorities of uh, foreign policy according to the youth is economy terror and the relation to neighborhoods so economy comes at the top people are worried about economic situation especially after the uh, uh, pandemic and the disruptions it has caused uh, but you know when when prime minister modi also talks about atmanirbhar bharat it has to be very clear that he has not been talking about return to the autarky of the 60s or the 70s his atmanirbhar bharat basically envisions in india which is integrated with the international supply chains he wants to make india or this policy of atmanirbhar bharat is about making india more and more open to the world trade and becoming part of the global supply chains to bring more job opportunities in india so when indians uh, indian youth look at the atmanirbhar bharat they see no contradiction between self reliance and greater globalization uh, this is uh, the, the i think the uh you know the future which indian youth have in mind is to become maybe like southeast asia or china to have mass industrialization by becoming part of the global economic structure uh but it has to be uh pointed out that the indian youth favors according to the numbers global solutions so you see when it comes to pandemic and also they are very open to working with the uh, other uh, stakeholders in the world they prefer solutions to multilateral organizations they prefer Uh, uh, giving more weightage or almost equal weightage to the national solution uh, 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 and the and the global solution to uh, you know pandemics and all, uh, but there's also the question of mobility. So you see, there's a great optimism about going abroad to study, but there is lower optimism about staying there and working in those country, and that is the reflection of the backlash which has emerged in the foreign countries, especially in the Western countries, against the. immigration and globalization so overall i would say that indian youth are very open minded according to the survey when it comes to globalization and international cooperation but they are also worried about the barriers which are being erected in the western countries uh, especially in the last uh, decade or so hmm. and natasha why is there low awareness particularly of the recent platforms and forums if you look at it such as the bay of bengal initiative for multi sectoral technical and uh, economic cooperation that is bimstec or uh, the so south asian association for regional cooperation the group of g20 and the shanghai cooperation or other regional groupings and these are groupings uh, which have really changed the entire balance of power the axis is shifting and this is a reflection of the entire global diplomatic sphere is changing and why is there lack of awareness in this particular survey according to you Yeah, I think there's a few different things going on there. Um, there's certainly the the level to which young people are engaged on some of these issues down to that technical detail. I think generally when we survey the public, we expect them to have a general sense of countries in the world, issues that matter to them, perhaps things that they see featured on the news regularly. The flip side of that though is that they perhaps are not so engaged with regional architecture or multilateral institutions but some of these numbers you know I would agree are surprising you know for somebody like me who sees um until very recently the non aligned movement as part of india's dna it was really interesting to see that so many young indians didn't actually know what that was I suppose the one bright spot was the quad which it seems that many young indians are engaged with and supportive of and of course coming from australia which has put such a high level of priority on the quad going forward i think that actually you'll see more engagement and awareness in the indian public of the quad than you would in the australian public so that's quite interesting to me but yeah i think just as a general rule you know we don't expect average um people are going about their lives doing their jobs to necessarily know a lot about ASEAN to know a lot about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization but it is interesting to see what has resonated what has cut through what has come through in the media the last thing i just want to say is that of course this survey was happening at a time that um a, a great pandemic and just before that second wave in india so um i think it's quite understandable that a lot of the information people are consuming and the media that they're really absorbing would have been focused on that issue and mr azak this is almost like a joint challenge as far as india and bangladesh and multiple countries are are facing towards you know from an expansionist china and that is also reflecting a lot in this survey with degree of skepticism um, and greater concern among the youth so 
I means when you, when we talk about China, of course, it's a very different uh, dynamics in Bangladesh for that matter. Bangladeshis, they believe that Bangladesh should have a very good relationship with India. But at the same time, uh, in generic fashion, Bangladeshis understand that, of course, China is a global economic power. And that's where, you know, Bangladeshis believe that there should be also a good relationship with China itself. Um, and this is where uh, some of the conflicting issues comes in. And uh, we as politicians or legislators or stakeholders, we have to actually address those things. And we try to do, do so. Now, when we uh, discuss uh, the matters between economic and uh, regional cooperation, of course, India takes precedence. And uh, so it should be because India is our you know, nearest neighbor and India is the largest uh, uh, I mean, Bangladesh is the largest imp importer from India. And uh, on the other hand, uh, China has in the recent years have had tremendous uh, um, projects, which, you know, you can call them, you know, the, um, the Silk Road revival, uh, the uh, what we call the one, uh, one world, one, one belt, one road initiative and so forth and so forth. So these outreaches have had uh, some reflection amongst the youth. And this is a challenge that both the government and not only the government, the stakeholders and uh, of course the youth should be more engaged to understand better. And uh, this is where um, there have been lacking from uh, Bangladesh's part because we cannot expect India to come into Bangladesh uh, to actually have uh, to engage with the youth. Rather, the Bangladeshis need to be more engaged to ensure and to express the foreign policies that goes along with these collaborations and cooperations. So we stand by uh, in a very simple, uh, simplicit ma manner that India is our neighbor. And of course, we will continue to have good relationship with India. But of course, China, in terms of trade and commerce, if they do come by, we will, of course, you know, um, shake hand and uh, try to work along with it. And there's a great degree of aspiration attached to USC. Security Council, uh, you know, permanent uh, uh, seat, Nivedita. Why do we see that? Is it because the media tends to discuss that or not? I think one of the factors you could say that uh, it's the media coverage. Even we have seen most recently in the case of India taking over the chairmanship of the Security yeah. Council for a month. And there has been a lot of media coverage around it. So it is definitely one issue. Uh, around which uh, a lot of uh, media attention is, it, it, it surrounds that issue. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's a, it's a little more than that because India does see, it's, it, it sees itself as an important part of, uh, of, this, of the global affairs. And it believes that as an important power in South Asia, in Asia, it, it contributes to the world in certain ways. And given the fact that India has engaged with the United Nations since its very beginning, it is time for the emerging powers, not just India, uh, other emerging powers like Germany, like Japan, like Brazil, to take their place in the United Nations. And we all understand that the United Nations Security Council is the body that the sort of, uh, that is, it, it's the leading, uh, uh, leading group within the United Nations. It is, it is the grouping where the power of the United Nations essentially resides. So when we see all these powers emerging in the world, I think it's a very uh, natural aspiration for any nation to sort of also aspire for, uh, for more equitable multilateral organizations. I think that has been the call for a very long time from the developing nations that not just in the United Nations, in the IMF, in the World Bank, that these emerging countries should be given their rightful place and we cannot have uh, a changing world order, but at the same time, uh, keep uh, keep the United Nations Security Council stuck in the post-World War II uh, scenario. So something has to change. So I think it's a rather fair aspiration, I would say. Hmm. And uh, Parag, then in that case, in a post-COVID era, if this is what the Indian youth um, aspire for for their own country in terms of their foreign policy. If it is says that uh, you know the survey says that over seventy four percent felt that India's quest to acquire a permanent seat at the UNSC was a very important goal for India. Uh, 
if indian youth feel that they are such an important player globally that is the reason why india should be there uh, do you think it will also resonate with youth in other country that indian youth matter india matters and hence they deserve that uh, place at the high table well i certainly hope so i mean i hope that this report is going to be talked about of course not just in the indian media but uh, in the us media and the european media and i hope that we would conduct uh, a similar exercise in the eu to look for what uh, young europeans aspire to because i think that is very very important and we're seeing also a real rapprochement between the eu and india right now on a number of issues such as the the developments in the indo pacific but not only um i think the having a permanent seat at the U, uh, united nations security council is both a very symbolic and and concrete uh, realization um i i was listening very attentively to what nevedeta was saying about how you know it it is normal uh, for young people to aspire for their countries to have their right its rightful place in the world i fully agree with that but there was a long time during which indian por- foreign policy didn't really agree with that i remember a conversation uh, five, six years ago with a former deputy indian deputy nsa who uh, whom i was interrogating uh, as a franco indian about why india didn't want to be more present uh, on the world stage and didn't want to take more part in international affairs and 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 they told me um uh, that you know this was the tradition of indian foreign policy india was focused on domestic self reliance focused on its neighborhood and wanted to act uh, diplomatically but was going to have a restrained place basically on on the world affairs um this reality is changing and and i you know i i think it really is great that it is changing but that will also mean for india to invest a lot more in its diplomatic service uh to have bigger embassies to have um maybe indian cultural centers to look at how to develop yeah. the soft power elsewhere in the world this you know this will mean more financial investment as well um and so again trying to reconcile the tension between domestic self reliance and having a true international outlook but for india to be this global actor it will need to ha- to invest financially a lot uh, in its diplomatic service hmm. so it has to be more you know perhaps in a post covid era as we have been discussing it will be a different uh, dynamics that will be playing out as well natasha go ahead Oh, I, I just think that's so interesting to think about how India kind of sees itself in the world and how that's changing. Something that really strikes me as being really fascinating is that tension between the globalization and self-reliance that some of the other pa- panelists had talked about. And it just makes me think over how over perhaps the last five years, you've seen a lot of countries where the public has become a little bit disenchanted with globalization um, and they've felt like the economy has not worked in their favor. They've become more protectionist and perhaps more populist. And then in India, you see you know perhaps a turn away from protectionism but still that interest in self-reliance and domestic development i think those trends for young people and the way in which young people are engaged and are able to um kind of be harnessed in a more outward looking india i think that's just going to be fascinating to watch and that's why watching this survey in particular trend over time and the way that that perhaps tracks with indian foreign policy is um yeah i just think it's going to be incredibly interesting mr razak is um indian youth's viewpoint on their own foreign policy also reflecting how youth in other countries look at us um, of course it does because when you have engagement and that's where the engagement happens and engagements uh, reflects how uh, the relationship be built on so you know for instance we started um, getting these sort of engagement happening for the last couple of years dhaka global dialogue was some of the initiative which i was a part of with orf so those sort of engagements will allow us to broaden our view in terms of global citizenship global ownership and uh, how we should contribute uh, towards global cause so engagements are the basis and and the f- fundamentals behind how we can develop uh, a policy and this this policy itself i have gone through a little bit of these uh, this survey itself i think the policy and the survey itself does indicate how people think 
but of course a deep uh, thinking and much more integrated approach can be taken up and i just want to include one of this uh, aspect that you we have mentioned and you have discussed about that bimstech and sark and other multi uh, country initiative that has been taken up unfortunately uh, this is these uh, initiatives have not had too much of success when you do not have a success uh, uh, for any sort of initiatives of such, you cannot actually, the youth cannot relate how they are benefited from it. So that's where the lacking happens happens in terms of uh, the outreach. So SARC initially was a great initiative and which had a lot of uh, outreach across the board uh, within the region. BIMSTEC unfortunately hasn't had so. So people and the youth, when they are affected and when they are influenced and when they are actually getting the benefits out of a policy, that's when they can connect. And that's where I think uh, uh, we have not had enough uh, integration between the neighbors itself. Hmm. And uh, Abhina, will you say that this survey is actually reflecting a lot of cultural viewpoints of thought processes that have been well bind in youth over the last few years, particularly the last six years. While they have, they have done a big thumbs up to the government's foreign policy, uh, but the view regarding Pakistan in particular, or even China, uh, that, does that have a lot of cultural connotations attached to it? Well, uh, as you rightly pointed out, that uh, the government foreign policy enjoys a broad-based support among the youth. Second point, which is very important, that under the a strong nationalist government over the last six years, after that, both at the government, both at the level of the government policy and the public sentiment. The Indians prefer multilateral engagement. They prefer, they are more open to the world. They want to have global solutions to the problems like pandemics. So it's not the kind of the nationalist assertion. As India becomes more and more uh, stronger and nationalist, it is not becoming like closed minded or uh, retreating to a shell. It is becoming more and more open to the global world. Uh, so I think this report is a great step by the ORF and it should be read along with the Pew, latest Pew uh, survey. Uh, on the attitude towards the religion in India, which will tell you there's a there's a big gap between the narrative and the reality on the ground. So I think these empirical surveys are a way to go forward. When it comes to India, uh, Pakistan and China, of course we can you know uh, the recent clashes with the Chinese uh, army and also the pandemic has deteriorated the sentiment of the Indians towards the China. But China, Indians always saw China as the competitor. So uh, the preference towards the America and negative sentiments toward China are correlated to each other. If that changes, we will see the change in number in the next few years. With Pakistan, of course, that's a different problem. Uh, irrespective of the government in power, the relations have not been good and sentiments have never been good. So I think this is a good survey to capture the, uh, you know, the evolving sentiments over the next few years. And I congratulate you all for it. Okay. The final words to you, Nivedita. Uh, what next? How do you plan to take this forward? Samaria, so as I said, ORF has decided that this will be an annual survey. So uh, as, as we have already seen in the case of Lowy Institute, they have been conducting these foreign policy polls uh, over the years. And, and it has built up such an immense set of data that now informs uh, Lowy in Institute's study of entire Asia and how power has been shifting. So I think uh, once we do this annual process, we will also have a similar data set and that will help us understand how Indian foreign policy is shifting and along with it, how the Indian public opinion is, is shifting along with it. And I think the survey also throws up some very interesting findings, not just in terms of the predictable results. So, you know, our uh, concerns about China is rather predictable. India's uh, concerns about Pakistan is also very unpredictable. But there are also certain unpredictable findings that sort of can form the basis for future research. So for instance, the expert discourse on Sri Lanka is dominated about yes. uh, the concern about the fact that, you know, its relations are growing with China, but the people have a very high trust levels about Sri Lanka. So, so we have seen similar findings, you know, the case of Russia, there's, we can see a slight shift of public opinion. So we do see that there's some divergences from the dominant discourse as well. So I think together this forms a very good basis for future research. So I hope this will continue in the future and we'll next year we'll again be here for another such discussion. 
All right, Nivedita, congratulations and congratulations to the ORF for this finding. This, of course, uh, will ensure that there's a body of work that builds up a data of this nature, which will ensure that several of us would be interested in understanding the and uh, and coming to conclusions based on the based on reading the mind of youth. Thank you so much for joining us, Naeem, Tara, Natasha, Abhina, and of course Nivedita. That's all uh, from all of us in this discussion. Thanks so much for watching.